the characteristic that this universe, the entropy seems to be always increasing. What does that show to you about the evolution of Well, okay, so, so first of all, we have to say time. what entropy is. Yes. Okay, and that's very confused in the history of thermodynamics because entropy was first introduced by a guy called Rudolf Clausius, and he did it in terms of heat and temperature, okay? Subsequently, it was reformulated by a guy called Ludwig Boltzmann, um, and uh, he formulated it in a much more kind of combinatorial type way. But he always claimed that it was equivalent to Clausius' mm -hmm. thing, and in, in one particular simple example it is, but that connection between these two formulations of entropy, they've never been connected. I mean, it's, there, there's really, so, okay, so the more general definition of entropy due to Boltzmann is, is the following thing. So you say, I have a system and it has many possible configurations. The molecules can be in many different arrangements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If we know something about the system, for example, we know it's in a box, it has a certain pressure, it has a certain temperature, we know these overall facts about it. Then we say, how many microscopic configurations of the system are possible given those overall constraints? Mm -hmm. um, and the entropy is the logarithm of that number. Mm -hmm. That's the definition. And that's the kind of the general definition of entropy that, that turns out to be useful. Now, in Boltzmann's time, he thought these molecules could be placed anywhere you want. He didn't think, and, but he said, oh, actually, we can make it a lot simpler by having the molecules be discrete. Well, actually, he didn't know molecules existed, right? In, in, those, in his time, 1860s and so on, uh, the idea that matter might be made of discrete stuff had been floated ever since ancient Greek times, but it had been a long time debate about, you know, is matter discrete, is it continuous? At the moment, of, uh, where at that time, people mostly thought that matter was continuous. And um, it was all confused with this question about what heat is, and people thought heat was this fluid, mm -hmm. and um, it was it was a big big muddle. And um, the uh, uh, and this, but Boltzmann said, let's assume there are discrete molecules. Let's even assume they have discrete energy levels. Let's say everything is discrete. Then we can do sort of combinatorial mathematics and work out how many configurations of these things there would be in the box, and we can say we can compute this entropy quantity. Um, but he said, but of course, it's just a fiction that these things are discrete. So he said, and this is an interesting piece of history, by the way, that, 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 you know, that was at that time, people didn't know molecules existed. There were other hints from, from looking at uh, kind of chemistry that there might be discrete atoms and so on, just from the, the combinatorics of, you know, two hydrogens and one oxygen make water, you know, two, mm -hmm. two amounts of hydrogen plus one amount of oxygen together make water, things like this. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't known that discrete molecules existed. And, and in fact, the um, uh, people, you know, it wasn't until the beginning of the, of the 20th century that Brownian motion was the final giveaway. Mm -hmm. Brownian motion is, you know, you look under a microscope at these little pieces from pollen grains, you see they're being discreetly kicked. <laughs> and those kicks are water molecules hitting them, mm -hmm. and they're discrete. Um, and uh, in fact, it was, um, it was really quite interesting history. I mean, Boltzmann had worked out how things could be discrete and had basically invented something like quantum theory in, in the 1860s, mm -hmm. and, uh, but he just thought it wasn't really the way it worked. And then just a piece of physics history, because I think it's kind of interesting, in, in 1900, this guy called Max Planck, mm -hmm. who'd been a long time thermodynamics person, who was trying to, everybody was trying to prove the second order of thermodynamics, including Max Planck. And Max Planck believed that radiation, like electromagnetic radiation, somehow the interaction of that with matter was going to prove the second law of thermodynamics. But he had these experiments that people had done on black body radiation, and there were these curves, and you couldn't fit the curve based on his idea for how radiation interacted with matter. Those curves, you couldn't figure out how to fit those curves. Mm -hmm. Except he noticed that if he just did what Boltzmann had done, and assumed that electromagnetic radiation was discrete, he could fit the curves. He said, but you know, this is just a, you know, it just happens to work this way. Then Einstein came along and said, well, by the way, you know, uh, the electromagnetic field might actually be discrete. It might be made of photons. And then that explains how this all works. And that was, you know, in 1905, that was that was how um, uh, kind of that was how quant that piece of quantum mechanics got started. Kind of interesting, interesting piece of history. I didn't know until I was researching this recently, 
1903, Einstein wrote three different papers, and uh, so, you know, just sort of uh, well-known physics history. In 1905, Einstein wrote these three papers. One introduced relativity theory, one explained Brownian motion, and one introduced basically photons. Mm -hmm. So kind of, you know, kind of a, a, a big deal year for physics and for Einstein. But in the years before that, he'd written several papers, and what were they about? They were about the second law of thermodynamics, and they were an attempt to prove the second law of thermodynamics and their nonsense. And so I, I, I had no idea that he'd done this. Interesting. Me um, neither. And in fact, what he did, those three papers in 1905, well, not so much the relativity paper, the one on Brownian motion, the one on photons, both of these were about the story of sort of making the world discrete. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he got those uh, that idea from Boltzmann. Yeah. Um, but Boltzmann didn't think, you know, Boltzmann kind of died believing, you know, he said, he has a quote actually, you know, uh, you know, in the end, things are going to turn out to be discrete, and I'm going to write down what I have to say about this because, uh, uh, you know, eventually this stuff will be rediscovered, and I want to leave, you know, what I can about how things are going to be discrete. But, you know, um, uh, I think he has some quote about how, you know, one person can't stand against the tide of history in, um, uh, in uh, saying that, you know, matter is discrete. So, oh, so he stuck by his guns in terms yes, of matter did. is discrete. Hmm. Yes, he did. And and the you know what's interesting about this is uh, at the time everybody, including Einstein, kind of assumed that space was probably going to end up being discrete too, but that didn't work out technically because it wasn't consistent with relativity theory. It didn't seem to be, and so then in the history of physics, even though people had determined that matter was discrete, electromagnetic field was discrete, space was a holdout of not being discrete. And in fact, Einstein, 1916, has this nice letter he wrote where he says, in the end, it will turn out space is discrete, but we don't have the mathematical tools necessary to figure out how that works yet. And so, you know, I think it's kind of cool that 100 years later we do. Yes, for you, you're pretty pretty sure that uh, at every layer of reality, it's discrete. Right, and that space is discrete. And that uh, the, I mean, and in fact, one of the things I realized recently is this kind of theory of heat that um, uh, that the um, you know that heat is really this continuous fluid. Um, it's it's kind of like uh, the, the you know the caloric theory of heat, which turns out to be completely wrong because actually heat is the motion of a, a discrete molecules. Mm -hmm. but unless you know there are discrete molecules, it's hard to understand what heat could possibly be. Well, you know, I think space is is discrete, and the question is kind of what's the analog of the mistake that was made with caloric. In the case of space, mm -hmm. and so I, my my current guess is that dark matter is, uh, as I've my little sort of aphorism of the of the last few months has been, you know, dark matter is the caloric of our time. <laughs> that is, it will turn out that dark matter is a feature of space, and it is not a bunch of particles. Oh. You know, at the time when when people were talking about heat, they knew about fluids. And they said, well, heat must be just be another kind of fluid because that's what they knew about. Yes. But now people know about particles, and so they say, well, what's dark matter? It's not, it's not, it just must be particles. So what could dark matter be as a feature of space? Oh, I don't know yet. All right. um, I mean, I think the, the thing I'm really, one of the things I'm hoping to be able to do is to find the analog of Brownian motion in space. Hmm. So in other words, Brownian motion was, was seeing down to the level of an effect from individual molecules. Hmm. And so in the case of space, you know, most of the things, the things we see about space so far, just everything seems continuous. Brownian motion had been discovered in the 1830s, mm -hmm. and it was only identified what it was, uh, what it was the, the, the result of by uh, Smolachowski and Einstein at the beginning of the 20th century. And, you know, dark matter was, was discovered, that phenomenon was discovered 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the rotation curves of galaxies don't follow the luminous matter. That was discovered 100 years ago. And I think, you know, that I, I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't an effect that we already know about that is kind of the analog of Brownian motion that reveals the discreteness of space. And in fact, we, we're beginning to have some guesses. We have some some evidence that black hole mergers work differently when there's discrete space, and there may be things that you can see in gravitational wave signatures and things associated with the discreteness of space. But this is kind of, 
uh, for me, it's kind of it's kind of interesting to see this sort of recapitulation of the history of physics, where people, you know, vehemently say, you know, matter is continuous, electromagnetic field is continuous, and turns out it isn't true. And then they say space is continuous, but but so you know, entropy is the number of states of the system consistent with some constraint. Yes, and the the thing is that if you have if you know in great detail the position of every molecule in the gas, the entropy is is always zero because there's only one possible state. The the configuration of molecules in the gas, the molecules bounce around, they have a certain rule for bouncing around. There's just one state of the gas evolves to one state of the gas and so on. But it's only if you don't know in detail where all the molecules are that you can say, well, the entropy increases because the things we do know about the molecules, there are more possible microscopic states of the system consistent with what we do know about where the molecules are. Mm -hmm. And so the question of whether, um, so people, uh, this sort of paradox in a sense of, oh, if we knew where all the molecules were, the entropy wouldn't increase. There was this idea introduced by by uh, Gibbs in the early 20th century, well, actually the very beginning of the, of the 20th century, as a physics professor, an American physics professor, was sort of the first distinguished American physics professor um, at Yale. Um, and he, he um, uh, introduced this idea of coarse graining, this idea that, well, you know, these molecules have a detailed way they're bouncing around, but we can only observe a coarse grained version of that. Mm -hmm. But the confusion has been nobody knew what a valid coarse graining would be. So nobody knew that whether you could have this coarse graining that very carefully was sculpted in just such a way that it would notice that the particular configurations that you could get from the simple initial condition, you know, they fit into this coarse graining and the coarse graining very carefully observes that. Why can't you do that kind of very detailed, precise coarse graining? The answer is because if you are a computationally bounded observer, and the underlying dynamics is computationally irreducible, that's, that's what defines possible coarse grainings is what a computationally bounded observer can do. And it's the, it's the fact that a computationally bounded observer uh, is, is forced to look only at this kind of coarse grained version of what the system is doing. That's why, and, and because the, what, what's, what's going on underneath is it's kind of filling out this, this, the, the different possible, you're ending up with something where the sort of underlying computational irreducibility is uh, uh, your, if, if all you can see is what the coarse grained result is with, compu with a sort of computationally bounded observation, then inevitably there are many possible underlying configurations that are consistent with that. Just to clarify, I, it basically, any observer that exists inside the universe is going to be computationally bounded. No, any observer like us. I don't know. I can't. When you say like that. us, what do you mean? What do you mean like us? Well, humans with finite minds. You're including the tools of science. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and 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 as we, you know, we have more precise. And, and by the way, there are little sort of microscopic violations of the second law of thermodynamics that you can start to have when you have more precise measurements of where precisely molecules are. Right. But for, uh, for a large scale, when you have enough molecules, we don't have, you know, we're not tracing all those molecules and we just don't have the computational resources to do that. And it wouldn't be, uh, you know, I think the, the, to imagine what an observer who is not computationally bounded would be like, it's an interesting thing. Because, okay, so what does computational boundedness mean? Among other things, it means we conclude that definite things happen. We go, we take all this complexity of the world and we make a decision. We're going to turn left or turn right. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of reducing all this kind of uh, detail into we're observing it. We're, 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 we're sort of crushing it down to this, this one thing. Yeah. And, and that, if we didn't do that, uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't have all this sort of symbolic structure that we build up that lets us think things through with our finite minds. We'd be instead, you know, we'd be just we'd be sort of one with the universe. So yeah, to speak. so content to not simplify. Yes, if we didn't simplify, then we wouldn't be like us. We would be like the universe, like 
the the intrinsic universe, but not having experiences like the experiences we have, where we, for example, conclude that definite things happen. We, you know, we we sort of have this this uh, uh, notion of being able to make make sort of narrative statements.